Good evening everyone and welcome to another of your Friday night spooky sessions with me your host Hedda Gold. Now tonight um, you will be getting episodes 5 and 6 of I Made a Deal with an Angel. Um, I had a word with Zathero, the author. She asked me to take out the supernatural fanfic um, title because, as she says, this is all her own work. So I'm giving her all the credit due, due to her as the sole author of this work and wonderful it is too. I'm also giving you both episodes together because I wasn't here last week due to being under the weather. So I'm going to warn you in advance, this is going to be a longer video than the normal half hour that we do. Um, for those of you who don't like longer videos, maybe you could stop it and then come back to it. Um, or for the rest of you who want to together, that's fine. In future, um, I'm going to be taking one a week and then adding maybe a ghost story. Then I'm hopefully trying to make or keep everybody happy at the same time. But as always, you guide me. So you tell me what it is that you want and I'll do my best. Otherwise, I'm just going to have to hope that I'm doing the right thing by all of you. So where were we when we last left Sarah? Well, she had been shot at several times by the police. She um, was, there was a bonfire made of a priest set fire to the bonfire. She tried to escape from it and um, a policewoman was determined that she was going to stay and get burned. So Sarah held on to her and really tightly. So unfortunately, it looks like from where we left off that not only Sarah has burned, but so has the police officer. So we're going to start from therein. Now, Sarah's obviously narrating the story, telling it from her perspective. So I'm going to start off at the beginning and then we're going to carry on with episode five. So please, will you sit back, relax and enjoy tonight's reading of episode five, series one of I Made a Deal with an Angel by Zithero. And I really do hope you enjoy it. Dying twice sucks, let me tell you. What sucks more? I found Jason. Well, if you didn't get this by now, I'm telling you a story that's actually 36 years old. I'm out now or was and I found my son Jason. I'm not in the best mood. My own son didn't even recognise me. Granted, I can't blame him, right? He was only three when I died, but I was hoping for some photos or something. Dave's dead, by the way. Obviously, my mother isn't around. I haven't even looked her up yet, but I'm afraid what she'll say if she sees me. Worse yet, found out I've got a grandson. And that the angel Ubiel, the demon, has possessed him. <sighs> I'm rambling and I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me explain who all these people are and how they are related to me. You guys get to hear what hell is like while I sit in this stupid fishing boat because my wings are tired. Bonus though, you guys want to hear about how I met the frigging devil? Sure you do, and you will. Burning hurts, the fire, the feeling of your flesh peeling back and muscles searing. The worst part is how you feel what parts have just cooked. You go numb, you choke on the smoke of your own skin and hair. It's, it's a terrible way to go. Also, side note, Took that policewoman with me, you know. There's some regrets there, after I felt how painful it is. However, 
the next thing I remember is going down a rather dark tunnel. Soon a foul wind is blowing through my hair and I open up my wings to stop myself from falling. Looking as I circle round, I see a few unfortunate bastards falling past me. Down below there's a huge hill. I head towards it only to find it's most certainly not a hill. The people falling are smacking into huge piles of bodies. Most everyone is naked and each hit makes a sickening snap and smacking sound. It looks like blood is pooling underneath the giant pile. So I land a good distance away from it, taking in the fairly sickening sight. I notice the blood is evaporating a few feet from where I land. The people in the pile are all screaming and moaning in pain. For some reason, I, I don't feel too bad for them. Instead, I feel rather good that I'm not them. I take to the air again and, and I look at the top of the pile. I'm mostly looking for Judy, the police officer, but I don't see her near the top. As I land, I spot something flying towards me. I dread that it might be my master, Belial, but what lands before me is another succubus. Well, another succubus would be a terrible way to describe her. Each horn on either side of her head is almost four feet long. They curl out of her head and point near her back. Massive red wings close up behind her. I notice her hooves are covered in some kind of bronze boots, which run up her thighs in crimson leather. Her crotch is covered in a bikini bottom, it's a leathery looking thing with a bronze triangle. The red leather motif continues up her waist as a full corset that covers her torso. A posture collar wraps around her neck. Her arms are also co covered in red leather. However, this appears to be part of a dress where the front basically doesn't exist. The dress seems connected to the posture collar as well. Her lips are full and black, eyes are blue, and her hair is black as well. Sarah Baker, I assume. She speaks with a British accent. Let's pretend that I've got a sort of American accent and my British accent becomes very much more pronounced. Side note. Who wants to know? I ask. She heaves a sigh. Bloody hell, you sound like an Irishman. I narrow my eyes. F off. She shakes her head and holds her hand in front of her, an image appearing in front of her with writing on it. I'll orientate you quickly. Welcome to hell. I am Esmeralda. I am essentially the queen of the succubus, answering only to Belial and, of course, to our lord. She motions to a huge white tower in the distance. I sneeze from the ash falling in the air. Wait, so you're my boss or something? Esmeralda nods. I get that this is difficult for one of your social status to grasp, but what with you being of slave ancestry? But please, try to keep pace. I'm an effing Harvard student, okay? I'm not some moron. Esmeralda produces a whip from nowhere and it snaps across my face. Pain sears across my cheek and I fall to the hot ground. What the F was that for? Disrespecting your queen. Now, up wench, I'll show you to your new quarters. She says as she takes into the air. I follow her as the body pulse doesn't seem terribly enticing at the moment. As I fly through the air, I see pools of lava, demons marching around, and what looks like humans being horrifically tortured, being drawn and quartered, thrown into pits of boiling lava, that sort of thing. Esmeralda lands in a fairly not-so-on-fire location. There's a series of small huts that each have a door with a sturdy lock. Welcome to the Fields of Lust. 
Here you and your fellow succubus will do favours for Belial's indebted. Occasionally you will go out and feed on some lost souls, and I suggest avoiding any of the lesser demons or anything else out there of similar or greater standing. Esmeralda closes her wings as she approaches me. We succubi are the bottom of the barrel here. We are the lowest form of demon. We do not garner any respect. We need to stick together to survive. For the first time I sense some sincerity. Is Master going to punish me? Esmeralda shakes her head. You did what you could with what you had. Murdered two police officers and EMT and devoured the essence of three dolts who helped to create you. Had you actually not been in a situation where human authorities were shooting you the moment you were created, perhaps you could have done more. Esmeralda looks out to the large white tower. Lord Blyle is in the Blade of Pride right now, torturing those three dullards. They failed him in a way that is indescribable. Then she looks at the end of the row of the small huts and raises her hand up. From the ground, a new structure appears. Your quarters, Esmeralda says simply. I walk towards it, and when I open the door, all I see is a slab of dirt. There's a bed with no covers or pillows. There's a small window in the corner. This looks like a prison cell. Esmeralda chuckles from behind me. My dear, this is hell. After all, what did you expect? Royal accommodations? At this point, Belial lands near Esmeralda and me. He's no longer wearing the suit and hat. Instead, he's shirtless, wearing a silver gorget and medieval leg armour. He's much larger than I remember, towering above me and Esmeralda at almost nine feet tall. Esmeralda falls to one knee, a tail wrapping round my neck and pulling me down. Bow before our master, wench. My head and knee hits the hot ground as I'm robbed of breath. At this point, I also assume my new name is apparently Wench. Sarah, how unfortunate to see you down here. Sorry, master, I, I failed you. I say I don't know why, but I feel actual sorrow for not doing what he asked of me. It's not your fault, Sarah. Lyle sighs. A wave of relief rushes over my body. A weight lifts from my shoulders and a shiver of pleasure runs through me as he speaks. Looking to Esmeralda, I can see she's in the same state I am with our master before us. Before my eyes, the three morons who created me are thrown to the ground. These idiots. They are to suffer, Sarah. I think this is a wonderful first assignment for you, Lyle begins. Devour them over and over again, and when they request reprieve, give them none. Take them until they cannot give another ounce of their essence, and then do it again and again until I tell you to cease. I lick my lips as I'm giving my orders. Yes, master. The three men whimper in front of me. And Sarah? Belial growls. Be dominant. Give them no pleasure. For the next few weeks, I meet each of these guys regret having certain parts of their bodies. A weird thing happens when you drain a soul in hell. The normal mummification thing happens, but they kind of puff up again, but painfully. And over time, I notice they're getting less and less talkative. To be completely honest, I never learned their names. One day, after a rousing session, all three men started to act oddly. All three had stopped talking entirely, just laying around all day doing little or nothing, outside of breathing. My orders from Belial were the same. And I continued to ravage them, drawing less and less essence by the day. Uh, finally, after a particularly intense draining, one of the guys just didn't drive into a mummy. Instead, he continued to shrink. 
his body crumbling into itself until he was nothing more than a brown orb with a dim light in the centre. I was confused, but I followed my orders on the other two until the same thing happened to both of them. I stared, confused, at the three dim orbs sitting in my little hut. I walked out, not too sure what to do. The orbs aren't men to drain or devour, so I figure I can call Esmeralda. Maybe she knows what's going on. I clear my throat. Oh! Joy! Esmeralda! A few succubi around me look at me oddly. They scoff, ignore me and move on. Oh, God, it's like middle school all over again. I see Esmeralda approaching me casually. At first I thought I heard boulders careening down the cliff sides and landing on a particularly unlucky serpent, causing a hissing cry of anguish. She stops a few feet in front of me, with her whip at the ready. But it was none other than my crass bog trotter. I clear my throat, mocking her accent. My good lady, I have a question to pose to you. Esmeralda squints as if I just dragged nails over the chalkboard. Never, ever attempt to speak kings to me again. I would rather hear your bastardised Gaelic than that. She adjusts herself. Now, what is it? Opening my door, I show the three orbs. Where did you get those three soul cores? She asks, kicking one with her gilded hoof. The orb lights up for a minute and then goes dim again. Those are my charges, I say. Well, now what do I do? Esmeralda closes her eyes and I watch as her horns glow, an aura extending around them before it pulls back. We await our master. A shudder runs through me as I think of them. Oh, God. I say out loud. You'll eventually learn to deal with his presence, Esmeralda explains. He'll take his time, of course. She walks into my little hut with me and closes the door. So what's a soul core? I ask her. Esmeralda gives another one us another small kick, rolling them into each other. Think of them as the absolute lowest point a soul can get to. The raw building block, so to speak. Strip away one's identity, one's will, individuality, and all that's left is their base existence. And I shrug. So I drained these guys until they were nothing? Mm, doubtful. This happens when one's spirit breaks. A succubus has never caused such a thing. We may give pleasure and drain essence, but to draw away someone's identity is, well, unheard of. Esmeralda explains. I lean against the wall of my little dirt hut, grumbling at how every surface can manage to be uncomfortable. Belial eventually enters, looking at both Esmeralda and me. Well, 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 if this isn't my two favourite harlots. What's this? Emotions to the orbs. Esmeralda swoons. Master, Sarah was doing your bidding as you commanded. And her charges suddenly changed into soul calls. We had to consult your intellect before we did anything. My body's on fire as I move closer to Belial. What shall I do with them, master? Belial grumbles to himself. He would be rather agitated I did not inform him of this. Belial looks to me over. Sarah, you're going to meet my lord. Esmeralda swings again. Oh, master, shall I come with you? Last time Lord Lucifer's lost rose, I attended to him. He was oh so grateful and appreciative of my skills. I doubt he'll be in the mood, Esmeralda, but if you wish, I can see if he'll want you later. Perhaps you could sue them. Belial narrows his eyes at the blade of pride in the distance. Come with me, my Sarah. Gather up those baubles. As I move to pick up the three orbs, <clears throat> excuse me, I grumble about how large they are. They're the size of bowling balls, but without a quarter of the weight. 
Little sods couldn't be smaller, could you? To my shock, they grow smaller. Suddenly the size of baseballs are now much brighter. Okay, weird. I walk out holding them in one hand. Belial lifts his eyebrow. They weren't that size before. They are now, I say simply, sliding them between my cleavage. Belial takes to the air and I follow behind him. <clears throat> After a few minutes flying, we reach the very top of the Blade of Pride. The closer I get to it, the ivory white tower appears less solid white and more of a mass of many white building materials, few in a straight line. A massive balcony juts out from the top with an ivory-like railing round the edges. I notice that the rails within appear to be made of bone, and it appears the rest is constructed from the same material. As Belial lands, he gives me a stern talking to. You do not speak unless spoken to or requested to speak. Do you understand? Yes, Master. And do not, under any circumstances, disrespect him. Do you understand? Belial continues to lay down the law. Yes, Master. With this, the two of us walk into the massive darkened chamber connected to the balcony. Inside, I'm greeted with a gruesome sight. Hanging by the neck is a man of Middle Eastern descent. The rope digs into his flesh harshly, and he dangles from the ceiling. His gasping and rasping voice echoes through the darkened room. The room itself is cavernous, a ceiling so high I can't see to the top as it stretches into the darkness. Across the room, the dark is broken up by streaks of red light from outside. On the floor and wall in between is a massive throne. The throne's back is as tall as the ceiling. Etched into the white human ivory is an ornate pentagram. Directly under the pentagram, I see a pair of violet swirling eyes, like Belial's, but somehow burning brighter, stronger, more imposing. The head they are in starts to move toward the hanging man. Forty virgins, he says flatly. He walks into the light. A handsome face. The features look like they are carved from marble. Power radiates from his form his build athletic but contained within tarnished silver armour. Across his chest is a pair of glowing white chains crossing at the middle of his breastplate. The chains look as if they have seared the metal of armour, yet no steam or any indication of heat is visible. Behind him is a pair of huge black wings with flawless feathers, unlike Belial's which are covered in soot. He has long blonde hair, flawless hair at that. Everything about him is flawless, perfect looking. He looks like the ideal male, standing nearly ten feet tall. He looms over me, an even Belial. Out of sheer instinct, I kneel. A smile cracks across the beautiful angel's face, and his laughter fills the room. But it's not joyful laughter. It's filled with malice and a tinge of hate. Forty virgins, Allah shall grant you for the vicious murder of innocence. Yes, he shouts, yes. What fools are you to think to kill on our armed innocence in the name of God is justified? His hands go onto either shoulder of the man. His tone changes suddenly. The decadent delights I have for you will make you regret even speaking his name in my house. The man squeaks out two words. Allahu Akbar. Lucifer backhands the man, sending him flying into the air while remaining tight at the end of the rope. He hits the apex of his swing and then flies back, his toes coming within an inch of the floor before he swings to the other direction. At this point, Lucifer seems to notice us. Belial, 
to enjoy all the pleasure. Belial has been kneeling all this whole time. My lord, I have an interesting development. More interesting than me asking for a portion of my power to replace your shadow upon the world, to create a seductress of men, only to have her slain in less than a day. My lord... Lucifer's voice radiates off the walls and back at us so loud. It's as if I'm at a rock concert. Do not regale me of your pitiful excuses, Belial. Succubi in this plain are worthless as the ash that falls from the cavern ceiling. Lucifer is still for a moment, his eyes tracing to me. Are you parading your failure to me as a mockery, Belial? No, Lord Lucifer, I would never... Belial is cut short as he is jolted up from the floor. He flies forward until his neck collides with Lucifer's outstretched hand. I was very clear, Belial, was I not? I informed you that you were never to drag that pathetic creature before me. Lucifer squeezes Belial's neck. I can hear Belial's gorget creaking. Belial gasps. My lord, she has proven extraordinary. Lucifer releases Belial without much ceremony. Then speak of this anomaly and leave me. Belial wheezes and motions to me. <clears throat> Show me the cause. I reach into my cleavage and pull out the three marble-sized cores. I place them in front of me. Soul cores. What of them, Belial? Lucifer says without paying me any mind. She made them, my lord. Lucifer walks toward me, each footfall reverberating around the room and back to me and then again. He picks them up in his hand and as he does so they grow dim. His eyebrow raises and as he moves them toward Belial they remain dim. But as he brings them toward me they begin glowing again. Speak your name, whore. Set Sarah Baker. He places the orbs on the ground before me and pinches my chin between his thumb and forefinger, leaning down to me. Now, Sarah Baker, what are you exactly? His eyes swell faster and fill my vision entirely. I feel as if I'm being stripped naked, but it doesn't stop at my clothing. It feels as if he is stripping me of more than that. I feel layer after layer of my mind, my heart, my soul being peeled back. I shake and quiver under his gaze as it bores into me, as no secret of my life is left untouched, as I feel he could see things I didn't even know about myself. When he is done, I slowly piece myself back together. Lucifer slowly raises back to a standing position, turns his focus to be water to Belial. A word, brother. Lucifer's wing extends towards Belial quickly and then jabs into his chest, a metal-like sound ringing through the air as it pierces Belial's flesh. Belial gasps, grabbing at the feather, impaling him. The feather doesn't budge, as if it was made of steel. Belial steadies himself for a moment. What, what is the meaning of this, my lord? Did you know what she was, Belial? The soul you took? What sort it was? It's destiny? Belial whines. Only after I've taken it, my lord. The feather slides deeper into Belial's chest as I look on in horror. You're a greater fool than I thought you to be if you want me to believe one like her fell for your transparent ploy. Belial winces. There's less spirituality, fewer miracles, more disease. All since your daughter ravaged the temple of the guardians, my lord. The humans are less enlightened. Belial's feather rips out of Bel Belial's chest. Lucifer's feather rips out of Belial's chest, sorry. Belial takes a knee as he hits the ground, bleeding. The three half-wits are only proof I need of that. No advisories make for foolish human servants. 
Lucifer seems to spit out the word human out of his mouth as if it leaves a bad taste. From behind us, I hear a hanging man whimper again. Allahu Akbar. Lucifer turns and in an instant is by the man, his massive hand inside the hanging man's mouth. I will rip your tongue from your head, Lucifer explains as I heard fish, flesh and sinew snapping as he does just that. Every time you speak his name. And then if you do it again, I will shove it back down your throat. Lucifer's hand dives into the man's mouth, his jaws cracking and dislocating as Lucifer's gauntlet bulges and breaks the skin. Bone fragments pierce through the man's cheeks as he chokes on his tongue, now lodged in his throat. Lucifer starts to rant. Favoured of my father, made in my image to mock me. He shouts, given free will, as I gave to my own children whom he slew. The whole temple shakes. All for these monkeys! Turns to Belial and me, the violet eyes surging with power and rage. You! Sarah, what do you think of the humans, having been one recently? I consider my place for a moment, but I remember my father-in-law, my aunt, my friends, how my aunt was a two-faced bitch, my father-in-law's opinion of me. I think back to Jenny and Beth's treatment of me and how it led me down this path. I hate them. Lucifer's eyebrow raises. They're greedy. Small-minded, hateful creatures, I say plainly. There's a moment of silence. Then Lucifer approaches me and smiles. It's a horrid grin despite it appearing gleeful. It's full of malice, wickedness and pride. I rather like you. I just shuddered in relief. Lyle, pick yourself up and bring me those hapless fools you called your servants. I have some tortures I'd like to try. Lucifer then chuckled. Small-minded. Belial stands slowly, his wounds surprisingly still opened. My lord, these three are the sole cause. I have ordered Sarah to torment them as a punishment for failing me. Lucifer looks to the three orbs. After so short a time, he appears to be in thought for a moment or two. Lyle, she gets to keep them. They have an affinity for her for some reason, so they won't be much use to anyone else. My Lord! Belial is interrupted. I said she keeps them, not you, her. He points at me. Now both of you leave me and send me Esmeralda. Your succubus queen is the only one whom I can take pleasure in anyway. And then he eyed me. For now. At once, my lord, Belial says as he limps out of the throne room. I gather up my orbs, place them in my cleavage again and help Belial to walk. Once we're outside, I look at his wound. My master, why does it not heal? Belial grunts. Wounds inflicted by Lucifer's hand don't heal as others do. If he so desired, he could slay my soul entirely. Such is our Lord's power. I try to hide my excitement. Master, are you dying? Belial laughs. I'm wounded, but I shall not perish from Lucifer's chiding. Damn it, I thought to myself. Belial's death would have set me free. Well, that time it would have. You see, my master isn't Belial anymore. That all started when Esmeralda came to all of the succubus years later. Whores! Esmeralda shouted at us as we were lined up before our little huts. We are now in for a very important task. I look along the row, seeing a few faces I've grown familiar with. Lord Belial has promised one of you unfortunate wenches to a very important client. I can hear Mara, a friend of mine, start to whisper to my right. 
Not again. Lord Asmodai. And that, my friends, is the end of episode five. I just need to put my candle down in a minute and get some feeling back into my hand. I think I was grabbing onto it so tightly I was scared it was going to fall. And if you will excuse me, I'm going to grab a quick drink, which I really need. So what do you think of episode five? Um, it seems like Sarah has some kind of power that we weren't made aware of before. But um, I think we'll have to come out more in the story, don't you? As to what this power is and what she can actually do. And we got to meet Lucifer. He had blonde hair. Never have imagined Lucifer with blonde hair. I don't know if any of you follow the TV show Lucifer with Tom Ellis. Oh, he's a bit of all right, isn't he? Tom Ellis. Welshman. Speaks Welsh too, you know. Lovely fella. Unfortunately married, but what can you do? So. Oh. A funny feeling in my hand. Um. Sorry, usual fibro sniffles. Well, I do hope you're enjoying this. But anyway, now that I've read that one, I will now go into the next one, which is I Made a Deal with an Angel, part six. And if it's all right with you, I'm going to go um, straight into the story and then you can tell me what you think about it in the comments. That's okay. So anyway, I'm going to put that there and then lean back a little bit because I must admit I'm in a little bit of pain. Well, in a little bit of pain, I'm talking about an 8 out of 10. I've got quite a bit of discomfort right now. Um, so I need to sort of... I can't find my comfy place. But I'm going to um, crack on and uh, read more. So if you're still sitting comfortably, then I'll begin. No, no, I won't. I can't. Not again. Mara cries out as she hysterically falls to the ground. Esmeralda looks her dead in the eyes and I swear I saw the daddish lash out and crash into the shrieking girl. Mara whimpers. He picked me last time. He, he ripped off my arm and he... And she broke down sobbing. Esmeralda looks to me. Sarah, help her up. I nod and kneel down to grab her up by the arm. So that's all, my queen? A Middle Eastern voice says plainly, that's all it takes to avoid the ravages of Lord Asmodai. Esmeralda glares at her. Hold your tongue, Paranusia, or I'll ensure Lord Asmodai chooses you. As I help Mara back to her knees, Karenisa continues, at least replace Mara, my queen. Why not let Sarah onto the docket? There's some murmuring among the others. I've been left out the last two times Asmodai was called. Poor Mara was chosen both times. She's not too green now, Kirinisa continues. She's as good as any of us. Apparently better, being Belial's favoured. Esmeralda pulls out her whip. Our master prefers none of us over the other. Now silence yourself before I crack you across your throat. Esmeralda coils her whip and connects it to her hip as I continue to struggle to get Mara up. I don't care. Add me to the docket. 
I say as I stand up in line, propping up the hysterical Mara. Kairu Nisa just grins at me, snickering. I glance at her, spotting her brown eyes and yellow horns. Her leather is a mix of reds, blues and yellows. She's likely the most experienced succubus outside of Esmeralda. What are you laughing at, Gazawi? Kairu Nisa shakes her head. You're a smart girl, Sarah, but you lack wisdom. Esmeralda shouts at both of us. And yet, you're both here. So shut up. She heaves a sigh. It's I who chooses who will be part of the next selection. Belial lands next to her, and all of the succubi swoon. Esmeralda less than most. You're not the only one, my queen. He grabs at Esmeralda's rear. Esmeralda staggers for a moment. My master, I was preparing our stable for Lord Asmodai's choosing. Esmeralda lets go of it. Belial lets go of Esmeralda and looks over all of us, focusing in on Mara. What is it, dear Mara? Can you not serve me well enough today? No, master. Lord Asmodai was cruel to me. Not like you, master. She trails off. I let go of Mara and take a step back, as the succubus to our left did the same. Repeat that, whore? Belial asks. He... he... Uh, uh, well, I meant to say, you, you never treated me. Would you like me to? Clearly, if I haven't treated you as poorly as Asmodai can, then I must be doing something wrong. She shudders, half in dread and half in lust, you'll desire. No, 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 he, he just made me feel more pain than, 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 than you have. Open mouth, insert hoof. That was a stupid comment to make to Belial. I learned very quickly that while Belial paraded us around to every demon with soul cause to spend, he also prided himself on being a prince of hell. Belial's perfect mouth turns up at either end into a million watt smile. The kind of smile a lawyer gets when he wins a multi-million dollar case when his client is guilty. It's a predatory smile. Mara, is it? Mara nods cautiously. Ah, well, I want you to experience barely imaginable pain. Feel it, embrace it, through every pore of your skin. And as if every nerve in your body was experiencing the pain of birth, that first stupid hog Eve gave to all you little sods. Mara screams and falls to the ground, grabbing at her body and writhing it in such extreme and intense way it looked like she'd crack herself in half. I've got a lovely stable of horse and your task is to perform. Perform for those I give you to. I don't care what they do to you because at the end of the day, you'll still be my beautiful, perfect representations of lust. Mara screams are acting as a backdrop to Belial's speech. You have an eternity of horrific tortures. Don't go losing your mind just because someone screws an open wound. Next one who thinks they will get uppity will get tossed into the fire until I remember you're there. Which reminds me, I think we have a whore who's been in there for some time now. Bertha, my lord, shall I pull her from the fires? Esmeralda asks Bowen. How long has she been in there? Forty years, my lord. Ah, uh, what's the point? Why not? And he walks off. He says, your queen will be collecting the lucky winner once his choice is made. You all have ten hours to submit your most alluring portraits to Esmeralda. And then he left through a portal that opened out of nowhere. I could think straight again, we all could. Mara's screams were starting to get to me. Luckily, Karenissa managed to gag her, so now we just heard muffled screaming. The charred skeleton of Bertha was whipped onto the floor by Esmeralda. Her bones were blackened by the fires, but slowly seemed to unchar and turn white. Her flesh slowly grew back, then her vocal cords strung themselves back together, 
The screaming from her picked up nearly as loudly as Mara. She didn't scream for as long, though, once her skin reformed and her wings and tail grew back. She was panting heavily and completely naked, struggling to get up onto her red furred hooves. I moved to help her up, along with a succubus who was next to Mara at the time. Brittany, I think her name was. I generally don't socialise much with the other succubi. Like I said, middle school all over again. Bertha looks at us, visibly shaking, her deep green eyes bloodshot at the moment, darting around like flies. I figured I'd ask, Bertha, you okay? Her hands are around my neck in an instant, her clawed fingers pushing into the back of my neck. I'm burned forever, okay? Okay? How effing dare you? She lets go of me and collapses on the ground, now sobbing. Why? Esmeralda cracks her upside of the head, knocking her to the floor. Shut up and get dressed, whore. Be happy enough that Lord Belial recalled your existence. Now get your worthless self into the dressing halls and put on something alluring. Isn't Esmeralda just a sweetheart? She's all heart, isn't she? The other succubi scurry along. I help Bertha up to her hooves. She unsteadily stands, looking up to me. Bertha wraps her wings around herself and shudders, then looks to the ground. Sorry. I sign, I place my hand on her shoulder, walking us toward the hot multiple huts. Well, I asked for it. Bertha mopes off and I look to Esmeralda. There isn't a whole lot of camaraderie between us, succubi. The fact that, at the merest request, Master Belial could simply ask one of us any information he wanted and we would tell him doesn't really help out with that. I walk up to her. I'm ready for the portrait. Esmeralda looked me up and down, raising a perfect eyebrow. Like that, Sarah? I nod. I know you've been spared a goodly amount of all the suffering. You're smart enough to keep your nose clean and you've been around is more... Favourite acquisitions. I keep silent, waiting for her to get to the point that I know she wants to make. In case you've not taken heed to the signs, Lord Belial likes you. For some reason, your soul must have been worth quite a lofty sum to him. How, I don't know. She looks to where Belial had arrived from, the Tower of Lust, a huge black spire reaching into the air. But offend him and you will end up worse than that unfortunate one. She gestures to Mara, who was still writhing in so much pain. I heard a limb snap as she writhed around. Obedience is going to be the sole way you can survive. And so far, you've been well enough to be good and obedient. I raised my eyebrow. Well, as good as one can be down here. You have to realise there are worse fates. I look down at my own leather-clad hooves. It's still hell. Obviously, Sarah, what do you expect? Take my advice and make the worst of the worst situations. Keep your head down and mouth shut. How is it you think I came to where I am? As he collects more whores, he may be seeking out another to work under me, but above the others. And while he has not said so, my assumption is he would either choose you or Kerunisa, but you must remain vigilant and proper. Do not cross his good graces, bog trotter. This might not sound motivating, but down here, it was the closest to a rah rah go Sarah I was ever going to get. I understand. Look, just still take the portrait. I look up, smiling with my pouty lips, wrapping my wings around me, lowering them ever so slightly to give a bit of cleavage, just to tease. My hair is a bit wild as I look ahead alluringly, giving a smouldering gaze to my queen. Es Esmeralda holds her thumb to her pointer finger and does the same with the other hand, making a rectangle out of her fingers. She lines them up and then a thin vestige of me appears within her fingers. She turns her palm up and then looks at the smoky end in burning image before closing her hand around it. Drag Mara to her quarters. I'll talk to Belial about ending her torment by the day's end. 
as much as I hated Esmeralda. She was the only one who seemed to give a rat's ass about us. Some would claim she only did it because it meant she didn't have to do the necessary with Belial's clients. I knew better, deep down. I think she actually cared. She never showed it, though. I shot Mara into our quarters, just as Kerenisa shows her face. You will be a broken woman, Sarah Baker, she says, taunting me. So what? Then I'll be you, Kerunisa Gazawi, a taunt back. Kerunisa laughs. You're a foolish girl, you know that? Not my fault the summoner's got me killed after a few hours of my rebirth. Kerunisa scoffs. Always an excuse with you, Baker. When I finally passed, it was only because an entire city accused me of being a witch and adulterer. My original husband turned to an incubus at my request. So many little wives from him and enthralled husbands for me. Our harem was truly a harem. She chuckles at a stupid joke. I made polygamy a tradition in my family and country. That is how true the lust I spread was. She looked me up and down. What did you do again? I say nothing as I try to walk away. Ah, yes, you fed yourself to the wolf. I turn to face her. Why are you so certain Asmodai will choose me? Karenisa laughs. When Asmodai was on earth, he murdered all seven fiancés of a young woman. He coveted her and he slew any and all men who dared to have her. She grinned. It took the summoning of the angel Raphael to cast Asmodai back. I shrug. What's that got all to do with me? Her name was Sarah. My eyes go wide as I realise. He'll choose you, Sarah. He'll choose you and he'll torture you and rend your flesh. He'll break you because you are weak and green. I look around to see if I can spot Esmeralda. Maybe she can take me out of the running. Or get Belial to, you know, get him to choose somebody else. Ever since we'd visited Lord Lucifer, he'd been overly protective of me. Before I can go anywhere, however, Kieranisa's tail is in my mouth. My eyes go wide as the sour poison touches my lips. Kieranisa is standing over me as I collapse. You look tired. Don't take it personally, Sarah. But with the possibility of Esmeralda becoming a full-fledged demoness, that means the position of succubus queen may be open. You and I are in the running for Belial's favourites. As I said, my dear, you're smart, but not very wise. A tail wraps around my throat, and she drags me to my hut, placing me on my dirt bed. Sleep tight. I lay in my bed, staring at the ceiling for the next few hours. Kieranisa's poison was potent. For some reason, I had a very hard time fighting it off. Maybe she was saving it up for weeks for me. How long was she planning this, the bitch? I think to myself. And by the time I managed to get enough strength to roll off my bed, every joint is stiff and aching. When I do manage to get out my hut, I spot Esmeralda. <clears throat> Esmeralda, I need to talk to you. Esmeralda glances over to me, always looking at her floating notebook as I came to refer to it. Sarah, I was wondering where you'd wandered off to. I assumed you were on the prowl to feed off a few damned souls while we waited. She signed so many orders I had to put off while waiting. She glanced to me. Basically, everyone is now on hold until Lord Asmodai makes his choice. My eyes go wide. He's choosing? As we speak. Oh, don't worry, Sarah. Well, I would raise the price paid for you, making you less likely to be chosen. He considers you his most e recent acquisition rather special. While I'm mildly relieved, I have a sinking feeling that Kay and Lisa 
has done some rather nefarious work against me. Esmeralda lets out an exasperated sigh. Mara, ironically, is the one only one working. Will I release her? Esmeralda nodded. And she's doing everyone's work in order to make up for being left off at Asmodai's plate. I considered complaining about Kaira and Issa, but decided to explore the other curious thing. So you might be leaving us. Esmeralda looks me over. Word travels too swiftly down here. She sighs. I might. I might not. It's not my decision. She looked up to the braid of plied. It's his. I must have looked concerned. Oh, please, it's not like my tasks are more difficult. I only monitor who's been loaned to where and when they are due back. Then I collect them if someone hasn't returned our whore. You're basically a pimp, Esmeralda. Well, I'm unsure of what a pimp is, Sarah. How much has the world changed since I was last in it? Well, when were you last in it? Well, the year was 1374. At least that's the year I was sent to hell. I'd been on Earth for a good 200 years prior. It's funny, I never asked any of the other girls this. Shrugging, I tried to list some changes. Well, we have steel ships. Humans can fly in vehicles called planes. Uh, no one uses horses anymore. We have cars that we can drive that runs on gas. We landed on the moon. That was cool. Her eyes go wide. Landed? On the moon? As in, man has set foot up there? I nod. Why? Well, we had a fight with Russia over who had the best economy and well, we figured we'd try and get to the moon first. I explain. Esmeralda looks to our notepad, perplexed. In my time, the most difficult task in a war was determining alliances and what family could and couldn't be trusted. She chuckled. Travelling to the moon to prove your superiority. What an odd thing to do. Her book flashes for a moment and I see my portrait appear. Esmeralda gives me a serious look. I, I thought you said Belial would raise my price. Esmeralda looks to the book. Seems he did. She grimaces. And Asmodai paid. My mind was reeling and I had to catch my breath. I felt queasy and every form of nervous I knew I could feel but shouldn't. Soon Belial was next to both of us. Well, that was an excellent negotiation. Sarah, spruce yourself up. You've got 48 hours with Lord of Wrath. I turn to face him and I'm about to speak before his finger presses into my lips. Ta 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 ta, he starts. Don't you, you don't get to object, Sarah. You're mine, remember? Now, he places his hands on my shoulders. You will serve at his pleasure. Do whatever he wants. If he wants to tear a hole in your chest and slide himself into your heart, you merely open to him as you would otherwise. Do you understand? I nod slowly. I'm on the verge of tears. Belial then kisses me hard on the lips. The kiss is the same effect on me like an hour of foreplay. Tears are the last thing on my mind as I shiver in pleasure. Belial breaks the kiss, taps my hair, which straightens it and runs his finger over my eyelids and then lips, adding makeup I was unaware of. Flawless. Now go. Turns around and snaps his fingers, a portal opening up to a dark room before me. The halls of wrath awaits and your charge, the venerable Lord Asmodai. As I walk toward the portal, I glance at Esmeralda. She looks away but looks troubled. I can tell she wants to speak but can do nothing. This is how I know she actually cares about us. I look ahead and walk into the portal. Behind me, it closes, and I'm left in a dark room. I can make out a window with bars on it overlooking a high wall. In the distance, I can hear the sounds of armour and swords clattering against one another. Much closer, I can hear the sound of a whetstone on metal. 
I turn and see three sets of eyes. Two are red and to the left, two are green in the middle, and the last is yellow to the right. All six eyes look up to me from the darkness. I take a step back and kneel immediately. I've never seen Asma die, but I've heard rumours he has three heads. I hear the snapping of fingers as torches are lit in the room. Along the walls are all manner of weapons and armours. Horrible axes, spears, swords, daggers, pole arms and halberds. Armour of all sorts, all with holes in them from one weapon or another. Asmodai is standing tall, a bull's head on the left with burning red eyes, snarling, and a ram's head on his left shoulder doing the same. In between is the bald head of Asmodai. His eyes look angry. You're the Sarah? Asmodai asks, his voice rumbling in his massive chest. I nod. Yes, my lord. He looks over me. Are you frightened? I discover very quickly that lying is a very bad thing in hell, no matter what. And half of these fallen angels and demons, they do get hard on from power trips. I'm terrified, my lord. Mara spoke of your violent tendencies. You're silent for a moment. Stand. You're small enough without kneeling. I stand and find him a good two feet taller than me. I remain silent as does he for a time. My Sarah had black hair, he says, running a hand through my hair. Closing my eyes, I hope he doesn't decide to break my neck or tear it off my shoulders. I can feel the strength in his hands, the harshness of his gauntlet. After a few moments of this, I say, What do you wish of me? Lord Asmodai. His hand is removed and he speaks. You are young. You still have hope to break. He looks me over some more. Remove my armour. Standing, I start by running my hands up his huge breastplate, stretching up to fiddle under the spalders. As I do, I find the clips holding them on and undo them. I manage to catch the spalders each with the head on it, and set it to the ground carefully. They have taken the blade of the Archangel Michael and spat off shattered bits of hope steel after breaking it. They are not fragile, as Madai states. Keeping eye contact, I reach under his armpits and remove the latches for his breastplate, the back and front clattering to the ground. As Madai nods in approval as I do this. Next, I remove each gauntlet, I notice his powerful arms and chest. My hand traces over his abdomen and I feel my face flush as I stare at his impressive muscles. What is this? His hand brushes my cheek. What? Asmodai tilts my head up to face him. Your cheeks are flush. Why? My cheeks get redder. You're a very powerful man. <laughs> Just touching you excites me. His eyes scan me, looking over my body. His hand moves to my corset, his other on the back. With a swift motion, he tears it off me. My corset falls to the ground in two halves. I gasp as he does this. Look at me, as Madai says, his voice not rumbling now, but in a quiet bass. What I am about to ask you does not leave this room. No, your lips, do you understand? I nod. Yes, my lord. A strange look comes over his face. On earth, were you married? Yes, my lord. As Madai's eyes stop swirling, becoming still. Do this for me and nothing else. Make love to me as if it were our wedding night. My heart skips a beat. I hadn't heard the word love in what felt like decades. In hell, love is a sin. And that, my friends, is the end of episode six. So what do you think of that? Did you enjoy it? 
Ooh, we've gone just past an hour. I'm sorry, I was terrifically thirsty. Well, before this gets any longer, I'm going to ask you to please leave your comments for me. Let me know what you thought of episode five and episode six. And next week, I'll just be reading episode seven and I'll find a little ghost story to go with it. And hopefully everyone will be happy. But until then, I want to say thank you very much for being here. Thank you very, very much for watching. I do hope you enjoyed these stories. I know I have immensely. And I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. I hopefully will see you all again very, very soon. So in the meantime, I'm going to say I love you all, which I do. And I'm going to say good night to you. Take care, everyone. Good night.